Good evening, Mount Nebo Church family and friends. We praise God tonight for another opportunity to engage our hearts and our minds into the study of his holy and divine word. We are so grateful to have each of you join us for another Bible study tonight. It is our sincere prayer and hope uh, that you would gain something that would be beneficial in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray and then we're going to get it on into our lesson for this evening. Father, we thank you once again for loaning us this precious time together. Father, we realize tonight, O oh God, that you are the potter and we are the clay. O oh God, we ask that you would make us and mold us according to thine own election. Have free course in us, O oh God, as you see fit. For it's your prerogative, your right to do with us as you will, O oh God. For we belong not to ourselves, but we belong to you. And so, Father, we commend this time to you. Ask your Lord God that the, your Holy Spirit would come in, take control of this teaching moment. Let it be what you would have it to be. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Tonight we want to wrap up this, uh, this three-part series, if you will, uh, coming from 1 John chapter 2 beginning at verse 28, then traveling down all the way to chapter three and verse three, uh, on the benefits of being a child of God, the benefits of being a child of God. Let's read the text uh, one more time tonight for our consideration. First John chapter two, verse 28, and now little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, final verse. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Amen, amen. Amen. Pray tonight that the word of God would find its rightful place in each of our hearts on today. The benefits of being a child of God. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe on his name. There's some buzzwords, if you will, in that verse. One is received, but as many as received him. To them he gave the right, King James Version says, power. New King James uh, switches the words and calls it, gave, gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe, this is all a part of faith at work, the faith to believe that God is who he says he is, to believe that he sent his only begotten son into the world, and now you accept the son as your savior, who believe on his name, uh, there's significance found in his name. In fact, uh, right before he came into the world, when the angel appeared to both Joseph and Mary, said that his name shall be called Jesus, which means that he shall be a savior. That means salvation is found in his name. And so when we look at the context of tonight, of being the benefits of being a child of God, there's a whole lot of things that we could talk about, a whole lot of things that we have already talked about, but none greater than the fact that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
we ourselves receive a new name. When an individual accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior by faith, they now enjoy the blessing of becoming his child. We are adopted into his family. We, are, we were once outcast and rejected. Now we are accepted and become a part of the beloved community. That there's no greater joy that I, from what I've seen and heard about those who've adopted children. There's no greater joy for that child who were without parents now to have parents who felt perhaps thought that nobody loved them but now there's a family that that perhaps they couldn't have any children or just felt the urge or the mood to adopt children bring them into their home to raise them as their own god through his son did for us what we could never do for ourselves we could never pay the penalty of our sins and so God, through his love and kindness, sent his only begotten son into the world to take our rightful place. And in that process, we move from aliens, if you will, to now being a part of his family. You got to understand tonight that a slave, a slave serves his master not out of love. Slave don't serve out of love. A slave serves out of fear and compulsion. They're under pressure to serve because there is a penalty for not serving their master. They're, they're mistreated and other things take place. But a child-parent relationship is not characterized or built upon fear. No, that relationship, beloved, is established upon love. Love. It's a relationship that's built on love. Slaves have no status. They are simply viewed as property. They have no rights, no authority. They are simply servants by force to their master. But as a child of God, we are granted authority. In fact, Adam and Eve, Adam was given authority in the garden. That was to have dominion. Adam had dominion over the land. He had authority. And, and tonight, we have authority as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and since we have authority... There should be confidence and a sense of genuine pride in knowing who you belong to. If you are a child of God, you can be sure of this very fact, that God deeply and wholeheartedly loves you. <clears throat> now, we are, we've talked to some people over the years who felt like that nobody loved them, that life was this vicious circle of failures and discontentment. But to know that Christ loves you, and you have to know that, you have to understand that as you read and hear his word preached and proclaimed in your ears, you have to know that God loves us. Well, what's some ways that, that God shows his evidence of his love? The supreme one is the fact that he did send his son. But if you need something perhaps a little more feelable, something that you can feel, if you will, you ought to pinch yourself because you are still here and that's evident of the love of God. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again tonight. It's not because we have always dotted every I and crossed every T. We have not always done everything right nor pleasing in the eyes of God but because of his grace and his mercy, all of us are still here tonight. And so from that factor alone is evident of the love of God. George Madison, Matheson was a 19th century Scottish preacher. 
he was born with an eye def defect that left him totally blind by the age of 18. Shortly after this, his fiance left him, decided she would not be content to be married to a blind preacher. Years later, at the age of 40, Matheson was alone on the night of his sister's wedding. Something happened inside of him, perhaps the memory of being rejected by his own fiance years before that caused him severe mental suffering. Suddenly the words of a hymn came to him as he dictated by some inward voice. In his blindness, loneliness, perhaps feeling forsaken by the love of a woman, Matheson sought and found comfort in the unchanging love of God. You, we understand this tonight. Human love is amazing, but God's love is far superior. It is simply the most life-changing force in the whole wide world. There's nothing that surpasses the love of God. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, it's in our text tonight. Again, we hear the words of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, New King James Version. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Mm. We no longer operate from a place of shame, guilt, and sin. No, we don't operate from that position. We now operate from a place of confidence because as we said to you earlier in this series because of our position in Christ there's been a change of, of seating if you will we, we no longer sit on the outside now we have been invited and gladly accepted on the inside of where Christ himself is Lord Revelation says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man should hear my voice and harden not his heart, but allow me to come in. Watch this now. He says, I will sup with him and he with me. That there, there is nothing greater than time spent around the table. Because when you spend time around the table with loved ones and things of that nature, there are things that we glean. There are things that conversations that go on around the table. Things that, that oftentimes may not sit in right then, but years later. Conversations that you had with your father or with your mother or grandfather or grandmother. Those conversations where they would say, you may not understand it right now, son, but you'll understand it after a while. And sometimes after a while, it's years down the road. But that something in your mind, triggered by the Holy Spirit, takes you back to that conversation. And you say, oh, that's what that is. Oh, that's what mom meant by such and such. Oh, that's what granddaddy meant by this saying, or, or watch out for these things. That's what they meant. Mm. It is that, 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 that scene where Christ comes into our hearts, where Christ now takes up residence in us, and we now are welcome into the family, the body of Christ where we move from being enemies of God, now we become children of God. <laughs> my, my, my. Martin Lord Jones wrote in the Children of God some time ago in an article. It says, I do feel that this is perhaps the greatest weakness of all in the Christian church, that we fail to realize what we are or who we are. Hmm. Think about that now. That we fail to realize what we are or who we are. He continues by saying that most of our unhappiness is due to our failure to relate our trials to our glorious position as children of God. 
He asks, if only we realize who we are, then, then the problem of conduct would almost automatically be solved. Your position tonight in Christ matters. It, it matters that you belong to him. It matters that you are now a, a son or a daughter of God because it comes with benefits. All jobs, let me put it this way. Maybe I can sit it in your lap with this one. All jobs are not created equal. What do you mean, Mackenzie? Well, each job, based on the organization and, 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 and the owner of that organization, if you will, there, there's a different tier level of benefits. That there are some benefits that you just say, for example, that you can get on the state level that you don't necessarily get in the private sector. That there are some benefits that you may gain in the private sector that you won't receive on in the state level. Because each tier or each organization drafts their own benefit package that they think is, 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 is ideal for whoever would come and work for them. There are some organizations, they're great, they pay great salary, but they have no benefits. There are some who offer, again, a great job, but there's no health insurance benefit. There, there are no days off. If you miss work, you're just out of pay. So, so that, that's a different tier, different level of benefits. Transformation occurs from abiding in Christ. When we look closely at, at 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he tells us, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Just as he is pure. So what can we take away from this tonight? <clears throat> what can we take away from this? One is tonight we have to be committed to consecration. That is, that is, that, that's, that, that is, we, we got to be committed to living a life of holiness. We got to be committed to living a life to, to, that is pleasing and acceptable in the eyes of God. The wonderful promise that we detect from these verses is that number one, we will see him. Yeah, one day we're going to see him. We're going to see him face to face. And the old songwriter said, when I see Jesus, amen. All of my trials, all of my troubles will be over when I see Jesus. Amen. So we, we will see him. That's number one. But number two is we will be like him. That's what John says in this text. John says we shall be like him. Right? In, in verse number two, he says, Behold, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But watch what he says. Here's the transition in the text. He says, but we know. That, that is, John said there are some things that we know about this great day that we are looking forward to in great anticipation. John says, but we know when he is revealed. <laughs> Here's what we know. John says we shall be like him. Uh, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to see him. We're going to be like him. And when we keep that in proper uh, proper alignment, we should have, that, that should give us, that we should have a present and immediate effect on each of us tonight to know that we're going to see him and that we're going to be like him. 
Such a promise should motivate us to purity, living a life that is both pleasing and acceptable to God. The Word and Holy Spirit are, are like soap and water. The Word and the Holy Spirit are like soap and water. What do you mean, McKinley? Glad you asked. Soap and water are good for dirty hands. But in order to see a result, you have to apply both in order to see change. You can have soap sitting on your, on your sink in your bathroom and you can have access to water, but until you bring those two elements together, there, there won't be any change. And so it's the same way in our own respective lives we have to bring the Word of God and the Holy Spirit together because the two together will clean us up. Talk to me tonight, somebody. Here it is. The Word of God reveals what the problem is. Just, just, just like the soap. The soap reveals what the problem is. You got dirty hands. And the soap breaks down the dirt because there are some ingredients in the soap that breaks up the dirtiness, that breaks down that dirt and all those other things that might be on your hands. But now you got to add the water to cleanse the hands. You got to add the Holy Spirit to clean up your life. You can have the word and the word will reveal the problem. It identifies those areas in our lives that need to be clean. But now we need to add the Holy Spirit to that. It's the Holy Spirit at work in our lives that cleanses us and makes us fit for the Master's use. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, having these promises, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So what does that mean tonight? As children of God, we are expected to purify ourselves and to keep our hearts clean. You know the old saying, the old saying, and I think it's befitting for tonight in this lesson, the old saying is, don't let the devil ride. Because if you let him ride, he's going to want to drive. Hmm. Satan, beloved, will never be satisfied with, with sitting second chair. No, he wants to have total control of your life. He, he wants to be the reigning, the supreme being in your life. And so whenever you give him an inch, he's going to take a mile. Come on in here tonight. He always desires and wants more of your life and more from you. And when you realize what has happened, oftentimes you're so far away that it's hard to get back. I didn't say impossible, but I did say it's hard to get back. Because Satan will always make it more enticing over here than where you are. It, it, it's, it's like the concept that the grass is greener on the other side. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes you get over there and you find out that the grass is not even green at all. It's brown, but it's because of the lens that you've been looking through. Talk to me tonight. Sometimes it's the lens that we look through that messes us up, that gives us this false sense of reality. And when we really get over there and find out what's really going on, we say, I should have stayed where I was. <laughs> my, 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 my. So, but then this next thing, next thing, and I got to wrap this up tonight. You got to possess your glorious hope. Notice what John says in verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him. That is, John is talking about that hope that is in Christ, not in us as believers. No, the hope doesn't come from us. The hope comes from him who died for our sins. 
Your heart has to be set on Jesus and no other. Your hope is on Jesus and no other. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. Watch this now. All of the ground is sinking sand. That's a stark contrast to life in Christ and to a life outside of Christ. Because of um, when I'm in Christ, my, my hope is solidified. My, my future is already settled because I'm in him. But without him, I'm on sinking sand. I'm going down. All my hopes and dreams are riding totally and completely on him. That's a good place to be. But then you got to pursue godly holiness. Again, listen at what, what John said. He says, and everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What does that word pure mean? That means to be free from contamination, to withdraw from the profane. Purify is used when talking about ceremonial cleansing. Look at what John chapter 11, the gospel of John chapter 11 verse 55 says, and the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't take those moments, those festivals, those, those special occasions, those dates for granted. They, they held them serious and dear to their heart. And we should do the same thing. Purifying is used of personal internal cleansing of the heart. James 4 and 8, draw near to God and he would draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So that has to do with internal cleansing of the heart. Our hearts have to be right. We can sing as much as we want. We can shout as much as we want. We can preach as much as we want. We can pray as much as we want. But if the heart is not right, talk to me tonight, our hearts have to be right. Our, our hearts have to be cleansed. Whoa, the contamination. But then purifies is also used as a reference to the soul. First Peter chapter one, verse 22 says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, he says, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Hmm. So when we talk about purity, we're talking about, we're talking about our, our total life. We're talking about all of life, not just one area of life or not just one day, if you will, in our life. No, we're talking about seven days a week. We're talking about year round through, through every season of life. We're talking about maintaining a heart that is pleasing and acceptable in the eyes of God. Let me close with this. See, as Lewis said, <clears throat> if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. Think about that now. He says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. <clears throat> it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. See the difference? Set your affections and minds on things above. That's, that's where our mind ought to be. That's where our thoughts ought to be. We, we ought to be in the mindset of leaving a legacy behind. Doesn't matter who we are. One day all of us 
going to find out that our, we have reached our expiration date. And what kind of legacy will we leave behind? What, what kind of things will we leave behind for those who will take our place? To become like Jesus is the best thing in the world worth pursuing. For every other passion and ambition pales in comparison and is pure folly. There is nothing greater than to be a part of the family of God. I hope tonight that that is your declaration that I want to be not only just in word but in deed a child of God. Again, let me just let me remind you of our scripture from the Gospel of John, first one, chapter one, verse twelve. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe on his name. Who will you believe on tonight? My hope and my prayer is that you will believe in the true and living God. And let him be your guide and keeper. God bless you. The benefits of being a child of God. Till next time. God bless.